I'm wondering if, if Chad Johnson could just come up for just a minute before we introduce Norman Hill. Yeah, come on up, Chad. I want, I want you to just say a word or two to the audience about what's going on in Memphis with the sanitation workers today. Well, I bring you greetings from the uh, 2012 class of the Harvard Trade Union Program. Uh, and it happens to be a great honored, uh, <laughs> honored fate that I be here at this, at this time. Uh, but as always, to the distinguished panel, uh, you know, I'm one of those people who walks in the, you know, the footprints of giants. And uh, I just had the fortune under sad circumstances to speak with Mr. Lucy at uh, Taylor Rogers' funeral at the end of last year. And I'm glad that there's time before more of these heroes are lost, that they have the chance to truly be honored for the work they've done to transform our society and our world. And uh, Mr. Lucy is always is, uh, <laughs> uh, shy about all of his achievements, but he is a trade unionist, an international trade unionist, which, which is often overlooked. And I've had the great opportunity through meeting uh, so many folks from around the world in this class here to, to uh, be reinvigorated about being an international trade unionist. I wish I could bring you great news from Memphis. Unfortunately, as I was telling uh, someone in the audience, past is prologue. Uh, for we, are, we had two weeks ago the current mayor of Memphis decide that Memphis should no longer be in the sanitation business and seeks to privatize or roll out or deconstruct the sanitation department in Memphis amongst others. Uh, now, it's not all bad news because in the last year and a half that we've been undergoing this fight, uh, we've put together another coalition of peace groups, of religious organizations, and other labor organizations, and occupiers from the uh, Memphis Occupy movement to talk about the broader issues. Because while the city of Memphis feels the need to disinvest itself of the services that citizens need, it also gives away $300 million in tax abatements to the largest corporations in Memphis who already don't pay income tax, don't pay payroll tax. So this is, but this is happening all over. This is happening all over. Uh, but the fact that it's happening in Memphis took a lot of people by surprise. Uh, no, take some of you by surprise, but it shouldn't be because this fight is again, not just against labor, but it is against all working people. And it's about rolling back, uh, I'll, I'll be brief, almost done, is that uh, it's about rolling back standards to uh, the 19th century, I guess, if not farther. Uh, but I just remember what I was taught, you know, as a, as a young boy from a grandmother who grew up in Montgomery, Alabama, uh, that all work should be honored. It's that simple. If you're a working person and working a good job, if you're working an honest job, that has honor and, should, and, and, and has dignity. And uh, I'm glad to be a part of the process of bringing that old <laughs> standard back and reminding the powerful that people have the power and we are taking that back uh, everywhere. So thank you very much. I will say when Bill Lucy started it at AFSME, I think they probably had around 200,000 members and they went up to 1.4 million members during his decades of service there. And that's really some of the struggle, just as Chad Johnson was talking about the privatization campaign. You know, I remember a few years ago, people were saying, these, these investment bankers and hedge fund people have really sunk our economy. Now you're hearing all the time public employees are why the economy's doing bad. There's been this incredible, um, you know, jujitsu turnaround in which everything is blamed on the public employees now. It's an astonishing story. So people are really in the fight for their jobs and their careers and their, their pensions today. And so, 
the, the, these are going to be the, the struggles ahead that people, people are going to have to fight. And one of the people who has been very central in continuing to fight has been Norman Hill, our last honoree. And Norman Hill, he, he's someone who I think you originally hailed from Summit, New Jersey, and you went to Haverford College in Pennsylvania, and you originally worked with youth in Chicago. But then, then Norman worked with, with the Congress on Racial Equality, and he led so many campaigns, it's really hard to uh, document all of them, but you know, he helped with the major campaign organizing to desegregate all the restaurants on that Route 40 corridor. And uh, a lot of people there who eat at those restaurants today, I think they have no idea the role Norman played in making it possible for, for people, people to, 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 to go there and, and not, not be, be segregated. Um, he uh, helped organize some of Martin Luther King's tours, very involved with the six city get out the vote tour, um, Martin Luther King in 1964. Um, that, was, that was something Norman play, played an important role in. He played uh, an important role in fighting for increasing the minimum wage for workers in the 1960s. And he also did a lot to get minorities into the building trades, and that, that was, was one important area. Norman then went over to the A. Philip Randolph Institute, and he was the executive director. After serving there in the, in the 60s and early 70s, he became the executive director in 1975, and then in 1980, he became the president of Rawl. He served until the mid-2000s. Now he's president emeritus, but he continues to keep so many of the fights. And a few years ago, he came to the Harvard Trade Union program to talk to us about Memphis and the movie The River I Stand. So um, there's so much history and struggles that Norman was a part of. And uh, it's a great honor for us to, to be able to present this to you right now. And Thank you very much, Jack, for the very kind and overly generous introduction. To Omar, Elaine, and Charles, and the organizers of this event. To Diane McWhorter for her compelling presentation and writing about the life of one of the great people of the Civil Rights Movement, Reverend Shuttlesworth. To Bill Lucy, an outstanding trade unionist an effective leader of the Coalition of Black Trade Unionists, and to Mrs. Shuttlesworth for her moving and heartfelt presentation about her husband, Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth. To fellow trade unionists, guests and others in this audience, salvation for a race, nation, or class must come from within. Freedom is never granted, it is won. Justice is never given, it is exacted. Freedom and justice must be struggled for by the oppressed of all lands and races. And the struggle must be continuous, for freedom is never a final fact, but a continuing evolving process to higher and higher levels of human, social, economic, political, and religious relationships. I begin with the words that articulate the philosophy of chains of A. Philip Randolph, this nation's greatest black labor leader, the founder of the most historically significant union for black workers, the Brotherhood of Seaton Car Porters, the father of the modern civil rights movement, and the initiator of the epic August 28, 1963, March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. I've been asked to talk about my relationship with A. Philip Randolph. It's very difficult to separate my relationship from the campaigns in which he led and organized. Campaigns that I was privileged to be a part of 
through his reaching out to someone who was younger, much less experienced, but nevertheless willing to follow in his footsteps. In the fall, in the summer of 1958, I was introduced to A. Philip Randolph, who radiated dignity and integrity by Bayard Rustin, his most outstanding colleague, a civil rights leader and human rights leader in his own right, arrested over 20 times in the struggle for civil rights, and the organizer of the great 1963 March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. Later on in 1959, I learned that A. Philip Randolph and Bard Rustin were organizing a second youth march for integrated schools. I asked what I could do to help, and they said organize Chicago. I'd never done anything like that before. Was completely naive when it came to organization, and yet through friends at the Chicago branch of the NAACP, I was steered toward what was then the United Packing House Workers of America District Headquarters, where I was given an office and a telephone. And I began to reach out to high school and college youth and end up with their help, support, and involvement, generating eight busloads of youth to go from Chicago to Washington, D.C. for the Youth March, where to my surprise, I was asked to speak to a gathering of some 10,000 youth. In 1960, again, I heeded a call from May Philip Randolph and Bard Rustin, who had initiated the March on Conventions movement, pressing the major parties to adopt a strong civil rights plank in their platform. The convention of the Republican Party happened to be that year in Chicago, and so they asked me to co-coordinate a demonstration and rally to press the Republican Party to adopt a strong civil rights stance. We were able to assemble some 3,000 people in front of the site of the Republican Party convention that year. In 1963, again, a. Philip Randolph and Bard Rustin summoned me to the staff of the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom. They appointed me staff coordinator. And I traveled northern, midwestern, and up in southern cities organizing coalitions to generate participation in one of the great and historic marches of all time. In 1967, I joined the staff of the A. Philip Randolph Institute, first as associate director, then executive director in 1975, and president from 1980 to 2004. I was able, with the help of AFL-CIO field staff, some international union black staff, and blacks who are graduates of a joint program of interns initiated by the A. Philip Randolph Institute and state feds in key states like Michigan, Georgia, Indiana, and Illinois. With their help, I was able to organize over 150 A. Philip Randolph Institute affiliates in key cities in 36 states plus the District of Columbia. I did that while trying to follow the organizing principles of A. Philip Randolph and Bayard Rustin, who said that they pressed for a society in which racial equality and economic justice would prevail, believing that one needed at least a minimal standard of living to effectively pursue racial equality that they were committed to pursue racial equality and economic justice through a majoritarian strategy involving coalition politics. And for Randolph and Byard, the essence, the core of the coalition was a partnership between organized labor 
in the civil rights movement, between the trade union movement and the black community. A. Philip Randolph's words put it best when he said, in concert with their fellow workers, black people can take decisive control of their destiny. With a union, they can approach their employer as proud and upright equals, not as trembling and bowing slave. Indeed, a solid union contract is in a very real sense another emancipation proclamation. But with their guidance and help and support, I did not stop there. I went on to further organize Randolph Institute affiliates with a belief, as they had in self-liberation, that any group that is mistreated, that is oppressed, that experiences unfairness, that is treated unjustly, that is discriminated against, should take the initiative themselves to challenge the unfair and unjust status quo in which they find themselves. In short, they were saying, if you don't fight for yourselves, who will? Furthermore, they were committed to mass action. By that, they meant the march, the picket line, the boycott, some means by which those who had the problem and were being mistreated could with their allies, regardless of how much money they had, how much education they had, or what their economic and social status was, confront key decision makers in pressing for racial equality and economic justice. And A. Philip Randolph and Bayard Rustin were committed to fight and struggle aggressively and militantly, but also nonviolently, seeking the high moral ground, recognizing that blacks were both a numerical and racial minority, and that it was decisive to win allies among the majority to gain concrete, real progress. Finally, currently I'm involved together with my wife, Velma, who is here this evening with me and who is in our own right a labor and civil rights activist for many years in writing a memoir chronicling our trade union and civil rights experiences. And in the context of that memoir, we indicate how much of an influence and mentor A. Philip Randolph was, and how in the context of our trade union and civil rights experiences, we try to follow his simple but profound credo that you heard on the screen introducing this event tonight when A. Philip Randolph said, at the banquet table of nature, there are no reserved seats. You get what you can take and you keep what you can hold. If you can't take anything, you won't get anything. And if you can't hold anything, you won't keep anything. And you can't take anything without organization. And so I suggest that we and you and us together humbly seek to follow that simple but profound credo, not just tonight, not just tomorrow, but as long as we live and breathe. Thank you.